Good morning, and uh, thank you again for taking time to watch these videos. I I do apologize two weeks in a row <clears throat> with uh, having to do videos. Last week, again, we were at uh, Heartland Baptist Bible College, and we were uh, doing some ministry there. And uh, this uh, uh, this week, uh, I'm going to be down in Lakewood, Washington, the first church I was on staff at after I graduated school. They asked me to come back and to uh, preach tonight and tomorrow at uh, their fellowship meeting they're hosting. And so just, uh, uh, I'm sorry, just got busy. And uh, the, uh, uh, the ministry does that to you. Uh, don't ever, don't ever uh, uh, get upset with the ministry about being busy. Uh, everybody's life is busy. Successful people are busy. And you ought to be busy. Uh, there's no reward for laziness in the Word of God. Uh, in fact, condemnation for it, so be busy in the ministry, uh, but uh, also be uh, uh, be mindful. Uh, I'd say of uh, your family. Always be mindful of like of, of your family, and uh, it's uh, it's easy to rob your family of time, and uh, certainly, <coughs> certainly, uh, in the last month, uh, I've uh, I've had to be very careful with family time and make sure that I add that back in uh, uh, with uh, ministry. Uh, being busy, uh, but I, I love serving the Lord. It's a, it's a joy to serve the Lord. It's a awesome to be able to uh, to be able to do what He desires for you to do. And uh, so I'm very, very thankful for the busyness of ministry. You know, I try to surround myself with other preachers that are busy uh, in ministry. So today, uh, we're going to open it up in a word of prayer, and uh, then we're going to be in lesson number six. In fact, today we're not going to be doing. Uh, anything out of First Peter, we're going to just stay right in our lessons. Uh, we're trying to do a little catch up today, and we're going to finish on time. And uh, we're going to get everything done for the semester uh, due to my my mistake uh, in missing a week. Uh, but uh, we are uh, going to be looking at lesson six and seven today uh, in our in our personal spiritual development. And honestly. Uh, a couple of very serious and very important uh, uh, lessons. We're going to be talking about worship and praise this morning, and uh, we're going to be looking at the elements of worship and praise in the Word of God. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures, so get your thumbs ready in your Bible, and uh, we are going to uh, just uh, uh, go go to several different places uh, in the Word of God. I want to read uh, and just remind us of where we've been going and what we've been talking about. Uh, we've uh, We've been discussing private praise and worship, and uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> before we discuss private praise and worship, uh, uh, we've been discussing the mechanics of prayer uh, and our communication with God uh, and, uh, and not becoming mechanical and, and not becoming, uh, 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 not doing it in a way that would be uh, uh, repetitious or would be unbiblical, uh, not doing it to the praise of men, but to our, our to the praise of God. And to the glory of God, and uh, so we need to be sure that we don't become mechanical, that we just check boxes. Uh, the Christian life, I'll tell you this over and over again, and, and you need to get this: the Christian life is about being. Be, uh, uh, you know, look at the Beatitudes as Christ started the Sermon on the Mount: be merciful, be this, be this, be this, not do. And see, the problem with being a Christian that just does things is sometimes I don't feel like doing. I don't feel merciful, and so. I'm not going to be merciful, but if that is part of who I am, it becomes part of my life, it becomes part of my character, I've, I've took, taken on the character of Christ. And so when Christ would be merciful, I'm going to be merciful. When Christ would uh, uh, when Christ would be faithful, I'm going to be faithful. And so it's about being and uh, being Christ and taking on the nature and character uh, of Christ in our life. And so uh, that doesn't just come with me mechanically doing things all the time. And uh, I am not to be just uh, doing things. I'm, I'm supposed to be Christ. And in my church, I'm supposed to be Christ. In my home, I'm supposed to be Christ. In my work environment, I'm to be Christ in all of those different places. And so I cannot become mechanical in what I'm doing. And I need, in, in order to avoid that, I need to have private praise <clears throat> and worship. And we've been saying this for the last couple of weeks as we've discussed this, it's Matthew uh, 6, and that's where we're going to start this morning again. Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. Uh, also remember, if you'll memorize these verses, Matthew 6, 9 through 13, uh, there's extra credit on your final, and you can get that extra credit. You probably don't need it, 
uh, Miss Dawn, but maybe somebody else does, okay? And so uh, uh, go ahead and, and memorize Matthew 6, 9 through 13 will be a, a help to you. Probably most of you know uh, 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 the, the, the Lord's Prayer already, the, the, the section starting in verse 9. Uh, add three more verses, and, and golly, you can get some good extra credit. And then also uh, 1 Peter chapter, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 12 are great verses to memorize as well. Those are uh, uh, what we're looking at in the recipe for the Christian life. <coughs> but look here with me in Psalm chapter 1. I'm sorry, not Psalm chapter 1. Matthew chapter 6. I was even close. Early. It's too early. It's like 8 in the morning on a Monday. Coffee. Or some like to call it liquid encouragement. We'll get us through. We'll get us through. Look at verse number 5, and we'll read down to verse number 13. We've read this last few weeks. It says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter in thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. <clears throat> be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And, and so here we have this uh, uh, this prayer that the Lord prayed. And, and we read this again to remind you. <clears throat> the prayer began with worship. Uh, our Father, which art in heaven, it's talking about His position, where He's at. He's He's above us. He is He is high above us, and He's in heaven. Hallowed be Thy name, and He is holy. That that's His position. That's His place. And and uh, <clears throat> when one is confronted with the holiness of God, we have a perfect picture of that in Isaiah in chapter number six. When Isaiah was confronted with the holiness of God. Uh, it, it caused him to be humbled. You go and read uh, uh, Isaiah in chapter 6, in the year the king Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and, and, and listen, he saw himself lowly, he saw himself as unworthy, he had no business coming into the presence of God, and every time you and I pray, that's exactly uh, what we do, is we come into the presence of God, it should cause there to be worship, and when we get to leave the presence of God, understand with me, He's loving and kind and merciful and patient. And we can go on and on about all that God is. But friend, listen to me. It should cause us to make, man, I got down on my knees uh, a sinner. I got down on my knees uh, unjust and unrighteous and unholy. And, and I left with the, with, the, with, the, with the loving arms of God to come down and, and to hold me and to, uh, and to cleanse me and to take care of me. It, it ought, to, uh, ought to turn into praise. Prayer begins with worship. It should end uh, with praise. Luke 19, or no, no Luke 18. Luke 18, uh, when it talks about the Pharisee, once the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, I thank you that I am not uh, uh, as other men are, uh, uh, unjust, and, and, and I give do this, and I do that, and I'm better than this publican. And the publican, the Bible says, would not so much as lift up his head, face unto the heavens, but smote himself upon the breast and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the result was this. He said, I tell you, I tell you that this man, rather, went down to his home justified and not the other. There's, there, I'm telling you, there's something great that takes place when a sinner bows down before a high, holy God and worships him. Something amazing that takes place there. And, uh, and, and it should cause us to offer God praise, to sing God praise, to speak of God's praise. And, and, uh, and so uh, there, those are the elements of prayer. It's safe, therefore, to say that worship and praise are very important elements uh, of, a, a very important element of private prayer. It's very important for us to realize that. 
in today's climate of Christianity, the ideas of praise and worship are kind of they, they kind of do this praise and worship kind of same thing. They're there we, we came here to have a worship service this morning, and we're here to uh, uh, praise God this morning. And, and the reality is that that that, that should uh, they should it shouldn't be like this. They should be like, listen, if worship takes place, then this is what's going to happen. We're going to give God praise. That's that's they, they don't just do this and they're automatically because we've determined it's going to happen. This is what we're going to do. This is what's going to happen. No, 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 no. Uh, if, if we'll give God worship, then we'll be able to give God praise. Uh, uh, but if, if we if we decide they're going to be like this and this is what we're going to do instead of what God can what God's going to do in our midst, and then we'll we'll see how that, you know. Uh, we're going to do this for God, and then we're going to see what God does for us. And, and, and working together, um, we we make it about what we can do for God instead of what we, what God wants to do for us. And we're missing that a lot in in, in today's Christianity, is we're just showing up and we're just doing our little thing for God and just expecting God's going to bless it and God's going to show up and God's going to move, and we manufacture the moving of God. Instead of instead of allowing the spirit of God to do the work, and, and friend, we need to be very careful uh, when we are in the house of God uh, that we we don't we don't manufacture the working and the moving of God, but we get ourselves if we humble ourselves before God. We get we make sure that God is 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 is, is at the center of what we're doing, and then and then God can show up. But I want to submit to you that. In, in a lot of Christian circles today, God is a hundred miles, not even a hundred miles, within a hundred miles of what they're doing. And uh, these are in church life. Uh, I even put in our notes that uh, these are kind of like buzzwords: is praise and worship, and we, and we have a praise and worship service. Maybe possible. Uh, it should be that way, uh, but uh, but we got it backwards. We need to have a worship service. And if we do that properly, we'll have a reason to praise. All right, we should have worship and praise, but it doesn't sound as good in that order. So let's give some definition to these terms. Definition of terms, okay? Definition of praise. All right. An Old Testament Hebrew word, in the Old Testament, rather, uh, the Hebrew word translated praise means this. A, it means being deeply thankful or satisfied in lauding the superior qualities of uh, another. Okay. B, it is expressing thanks, singing, and shouting joyfully. All right. So those are those are the those are praise in the Old uh, Testament. In the New Testament, the word translated praise, it means this: a, to praise, to laud, to commend, and b, to give applause to. And so, uh, <clears throat> so we understand that this is this is the idea of, of praise is, is that. Uh, one would sing, one would shout, one would say, oh, glory to God, and, and uh, even even clap, and, and it's okay to clap uh, in, in church. Uh, I, I'm not a big proponent of clapping after a special, uh, but I'm telling you, from time to time, as we are singing about the goodness of God, uh, I man, man, I want to clap, and that's a matter of, of praise, and, and, uh, and we can do that. Webster defined it in Webster's 1828 dictionary. He, he defined praise as this. Commendation bestowed on a person for his personal virtue or worthy actions, on meritorious actions uh, uh, themselves, or on any valuable uh, uh, appropriation expressed in words or song. Uh, for, for a classic picture of praise, read Revelation 9, or 19, verses 5 through 7. And I'll give you a second just to turn there. Uh, before I read, but it's interesting that praise came at the end, right? Praise came at the end. The book of Revelation didn't start with, with it. it. It ends with it, though. And it says this in verse 5. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude and a voice of many waters, and a voice of a mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him. 
for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made himself ready, and her and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white. Uh, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessings, uh, right blessings are they which are uh, sorry, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And so uh, we see this is a, a time of praise, and 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 and, and, it, and it ends the uh, culmination of uh, of what God was doing. It ended with singing praise and to giving God uh, Alleluia, Amen, uh, for what He's done. Then, so that's a definition of praise, worship, worship, which we're going to talk about in the rest of uh, this lesson. <laughs> worship uh, or sakara. The Old Testament Hebrew word translated uh, at least 170 times in the Old Testament. It, it means this, to crouch, to crouch as the crouch of a lion. And uh, so you think of a lion on the Serengeti and just getting down as low as possible, trying to hide from that gazelle or that muskox, and, and uh, they're, getting, they're getting low and they're, they're creeping along. And it's, it's just something that's, uh, that they're doing through, uh, through, this, through the ability of, uh, of this, not to be seen. Think about that when you think of worship. <clears throat> that I'm worshiping God. I'm not the one that's supposed to be seen. It's not about me being seen. Woo! Kind of Christianity is all about me being seen. It has nothing to do with worship at all. Now, look at this. B it means to stoop, as in humility, to make audible sound. Low and muffled. Not even about my voice being heard. It's about God being seen. Um, to bow to the ground. To be brought low. To be humbled. To have uh, one's arrogance. Listen to this. One's arrogance knocked out. That 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 that. Listen. That we are we are low before uh, uh, the Lord. <clears throat> William Holiday. The concise Hebrew, and this is this where this is taken from, a uh, concise Hebrew Aramaic lexicon. That's where that, that information is taken. Uh, but I love the idea of one's arrogance being knocked out. That they just feel completely, they, they are completely humbled before God. There, there is nothing they have to boast of. There is nothing they have to glory in whatsoever. They are completely humbled before God. In the New Testament, proskanyu, or how would that know? Is used 60 times, all right, in the New Testament. It is this, it means this, to prostrate oneself before a person, to attribute their worth. So I am going to bring myself low in order to make sure that they they understand, that they, that I under, that they understand and I understand that they're higher, they're more worthy uh, than I am. Uh, B, a voluntary humbling of one person to express the worth of another. That's worship. That I'm bringing myself low to lift him up higher. That I, I acknowledge that he's higher, he's holier, he's, he's greater than I am. That's what true worship is. For classic pictures of, uh, of pure worship, again, Revelation in chapter number 5, we, uh, Revelation in chapter 19 and verse number 5, uh, we read about praise. Praise our God in verse 5, but in verse 4, look at this. It says this, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, crazy, crazy uh, I'm sorry, that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Worship took place before praise did. And it was connected to a position. They fell down before God. Uh, look at number three uh, under the New Testament. For, uh, oh, that's classic pictures. There's other verses there that you can go and read. Number four. <clears throat> and I wrote key beside verse number four. Worship is to acknowledge the worth of another by humbling oneself, by bowing, prostrating, bending low, a posture of humility before the one worshiped. That is what worship is. 
to bowing low. <clears throat> we need to we need to uh, have these definitions in our mind. In fact, on your test, you're going to be asked to give a definition of praise and of worship. You're, you're going to be asked to give it those definitions. So you might want to get um, uh, uh, those down. And it's good for you in your private life and as you interact with people to strive to have a biblical perspective of what what praise is and what worship is. It's important. You 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 are going to interact with people all the time. Uh, who are going to have a misunderstanding, uh, but we don't get to define things as we as we as we desire. We define things according to the Word of God. All right. Inevitably, though, some some will make statements like this. Well, to me, worship, and this is why you need to have a biblical uh, uh, understanding of what what praise and worship is, because they'll say, well, to me, worship is you know uh, you know blah blah blah, right. Um, and, and, and I, and, and, and then you'll hear, I've always, I have these things written down in the notes. I've always felt that I can worship God any way I please, and, and I can worship God anywhere I want. And, and uh, it is the same sentimental attitude that says, well, to me, baptism is whatever I think it is. Right? And, and I'm telling you, people will take these doctrines and then and, and take these stands. It's not going to be long before they're taking other stands that. That, that are also unbiblical in their nature because they've already been satisfied with their, their, their worship and praise of God to be what they wanted it to be, and therefore they're going to make the evidence of what they want it to be. And, and the problem is that you can go to, uh, uh, back in the Old Testament, they're stiff-necked. They're stiff-necked people. They'd already determined what they were going to do, and they're done waiting on God to show up and trying to get God to show up, and so they're just going to go out and do what they want to do in, in all doctrines. So... Uh, it's the same sanctimonious attitude that says baptism is this. And, and, and the reality is this. You need to understand why you need to have a biblical definition of what these things are. Is that words mean something. And no one is at liberty to, uh, to uh, concoct their own definition of praise and worship any more than they are at liberty to adopt their own definition of what baptism is. And about what a church is. And about what a congregation is. And about what salvation is. And when, when they define them in unbiblical ways uh, just to do what they want to do, understand, friend, uh, God's looking for that remnant that's going to stand up and say, no, 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 no. We don't just get to do it how we want to do it. And, and, and many times there's a problem in philosophy in, in, in what people are doing, and the problem they have in philosophy behind what they are doing is, is going to be at the core of why they're getting these things wrong. And, and they believe that, that what they're doing is about them, and the reality is what we are doing is about him when, we, when it comes to our Christian life and it, when it comes to the things that take place in the house of God. It's about him, not about us. And they have a wrong philosophy. And I'm going to be preaching at the, uh, at the fellowship meeting and, and, and God established uh, his, his ministers, right? And they were not ministers that were unto the people. They were ministers that were unto God. That, that's who they were ministering unto. And so the reality is this, that they were supposed to take people and bring them closer to the holy, righteous God. That's what they were doing. Hey, you come in here, you acknowledge you're a sinner, and we're going to take this sacrifice, and we're going to bring it under the throne room of God, and you can leave here sanctified and justified and right with God. It wasn't that they left the presence of God and went out among the people of God and said, listen, we're bringing God to you. Wrong philosophy. 180 degrees off of what God called his ministers to do. God wanted his ministers to bring lost society and, and, and social uh, uh, and social values and all that. He wanted them to bring them into the temple and unto his presence. He wasn't saying, hey, you leave my presence and you go take me out there. And, and I'm telling you, that's a, phil that's, a phil that's a philosophy that is creeping into Christianity and is creeping. It's already crept into Christianity hugely and you better have a biblical reason why you do what you do and, and i get tired I'm kind of fired up because i'm preaching to preachers tonight. i get tired of christians and especially preachers uh wanting to hide behind preference they want to hide behind preference and uh well i, I prefer it this way uh and, and they well you show me what's wrong with it in the bible no 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 no. that is that is 180 degrees wrong as well you prove what's right in the bible you prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You prove it. 
It's not up to me to prove what you're doing is right or wrong. You prove it's right. You prove it's right. And, and I'm telling you, if we start finding things uh, uh, biblically uh, as we ought, I'm telling you, we're going to find out a lot of the things that are going on in our personal private lives are, are, are not at all acceptable unto God. Not at all acceptable unto God. Let's consider this. What is a, number two in our, our notes this morning, in lesson six, what is a true worship service? What is a true worship service? And so I want us to consider a typical Sunday service in, in a typical Baptist church. All right. Maybe you, I'm, I'm assuming you've been to more than just one uh, Baptist church. Uh, and uh, and I, I guess we could consider this in the average Baptist church, by the definitions of worship that we just read, by the definitions that we just read, by the average Baptist church, what percent of people would you say truly worship God? They truly worship God when they come to the house of God. So we're looking at a typical Baptist church on a typical Sunday morning, what, what most Baptists would call their worship service. And uh, we've come to worship God this morning. Uh, and uh, that's uh, it, uh, that's uh, time to do that. And let's bring in uh, let's bring in the assembly, and then just let's assume uh, that the assembly is is just in their normal uh, uh, their normal service and their normal seat and their normal pew, and they've done uh, everything they've done normally for the last you know hundred years because it's a Baptist church, and we always do the same thing same thing. And then there's cameras, and they're not aware of these cameras. There's hidden cameras all over this auditorium, and there's. Uh, and there's a pe group of people in another room, in an undisclosed location, that we just pulled right off the street. We said, listen, do you have any idea what the biblical definition of worship is? Uh, and they're like, no, I, I don't. Do you know any idea what the biblical definition of praise is? No, I don't. Do you have any biblical knowledge at all? No, not really. And we pulled them off the street, and we set them in a private room, and we put up these monitors in front of them. And, and, and then we say, okay, what we want you to look at is this sheet of paper, and this sheet of paper provides definitions as to praise and worship. That's what this piece of paper does. And, and we want to, you to tell us if you see worship taking place, and, and we want you to be mindful of worship uh, that is taking place. And so uh, somebody gets up and sings, and uh, or, or, I'm sorry, somebody gets up and prays. And, and they're watching. They're not, <clears throat> I, I missed this. They're not hearing audience. They're not hearing the audio. They're just watching the, 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 the video. They're not hearing what's sung. They're not hearing what's said. They're not hearing... Uh, anything like that, they're simply watching what is going on. They're spectators watching what is going on. So somebody gets up and everybody bows their head and prays, and then uh, it seems like somebody gets up and starts waving his arms a little bit, and and, and everybody begins to sing and uh, appearance of singing, and and so they're watching this singing going on, and then uh, somebody else sits, he sits down, somebody else gets up and and, and talks for a while, probably giving announcements. <laughs> and then he goes down and somebody else gets up and we sing again. And, and uh, then we uh, pass a plate around and people are throwing money into it. And, and then uh, we sing again. And then there's a, a special or a choir or something that goes on. And then some lunatic gets up and rants and raves for like 30 to 45 minutes and goes here and there in the auditorium and, and uh, waves his arms all around. And, and, and he's the preacher, you know. And uh, then... Uh, uh, they, there's a lady that comes back up to the piano and somebody stands there holding a microphone and he's obviously saying something or singing something and, and, uh, the, the preacher's doing this motion and, uh, and like in, in a group of a hundred people, like maybe 10, maybe 10 people come down to the altar. And so then we go to the, uh, uh, the crowd, the spectators, and then they, somebody gets up a phrase, we all leave and say amen. And so then we look at the spectators and we say, okay, who, who here would say that, 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 that worship took place today? And they'd have to stop and they'd have to go, well, by definition, I mean, there were a few people that went, went down to the altar. And so we can't say that, that, that nobody worshiped. But, but listen, in the average Sunday morning church service, if we get a tenth, one tenth, if we had 100 people and 10 came down to the altar, we got a tenth of the preachers down to the or to the of the of the congregation down to the altar. We're doing pretty good. Well, well, why? It's because we have ceased to learn. We have ceased to worship, and we just by name call Sunday morning our worship service. And very rarely do we actually worship God. Very rarely do we actually worship God. And that's sad, but it's very true. I suggest that by by the reality of most Baptist churches, 
don't worship God hardly at all. They very rarely worship God. And uh, and if you said that to the average preacher, he'd probably get punched in the nose. Uh, and he demanded, of course, they worship. But but I'm, I'm telling you, by by our own definition, we worship. By our own standard, we worship. Look over at Nehemiah in chapter number 8. Nehemiah in chapter number 8. It says, it says this. In, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 1. It says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street uh, that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of, uh, of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the congregation, both men and women, and all that, uh, that could hear uh, with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate and uh, from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand in the, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they made and, uh, for the purpose and beside him stood uh, Mattiah and Shema and uh, Ahaniah and Uriah and Hakiah and uh, Messiah, Masiah and his right hand, and on the left hand was Padiah and Michelle and Micaiah and Hashum and uh, Havana and Zechariah and Maholam and Ezra upon the book of this uh, upon the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, and the, the great God. And the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads, and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Joshua, and Beniah, and Shebariah, and Jamin, and Akob, and Sagavathal, and all these names, all right? The Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So uh, they read the book of the law of God distinctly. And they gave the sense and they caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is it, which is uh, the Tirisha, uh and Ezra and the priests and the scribes and the Levites taught the people and said, All the people this day is holy unto the Lord your God, more uh, not nor weep. Uh, for all the people wept and they, uh, when they heard the words of the law. And they said unto them, Go your way, and eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them uh, for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord, neither be ye sorry, uh, for your joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Behold your peace, for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And all the people that were uh, that were there, uh, that went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and uh, to make great mirth, because they had understood the words uh, that were declared unto them. And so I believe here in Nehemiah 8, 1 through 12, we have a biblical pattern of a public or corporate worship service. Verse number one, the people assembled. Verse number one, they, 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 they assembled around the book, around the Bible. Uh, uh, verse number four, God's man and assistants, and assistants led the public assembly uh, from the pulpit. Verse five, God's people stand in honor of the word of God. Verse six, Ezra blessed God, the object of honor. And verse number six, the people lifted up their hands and bowed to worship. In verse eight, preaching service uh, uh, of proclamation, interpretation, and application. Uh, was given in verse number nine it, 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 an invitation or a response was that the people wept before God that would have been a sign of humility uh, again and then nine verse number ten benediction the people were sent out rejoicing having worshiped and responded to God that's what took place is what we just read and the question is this why would not the basic format uh, be appropriate for our private time with God in the secret place. 
we are instructed to worship in verses number six and nine. Uh, 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 our, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're acknowledging his position. We're acknowledging his holiness. Far above arms. A, <clears throat> what do you believe would be a proper posture for uh, to say, Our Father, hallowed be thy name. What would be a proper, proper posture? Or heads down. Not even lifting our head on the head. It is the revelation of God Himself, not is, is the revelation of God Himself not sufficient to put us on our face. Is it not? And then number two, we are instructed to offer praise. Verse number 13. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We're told to give God praise, and we're going to look at praise here in the next lesson. But in conclusion, in the, in the coming lessons, we will see great in motivation for private praise and worship. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5-6, through 6, God gives grace to the humble, and humility is the key to... Uh, uh, to uh, to uh, identify the true worshiper in Psalm 149 verses 1 through 4, God takes pleasure in the praise of His people, and we'll discuss that in great length. I want us to end though this this lesson in Psalm chapter 95. Psalm 90, chapter 95. It says this in Psalm 95 verses 1 through 11. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make joyful noise unto him uh, with song. For the Lord is great and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth, stretching uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hands. Today, if we will hear His voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation, as in the day uh, of temptation in the wilderness, when our fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with their gener this generation and said, it is a people that do err in their heart, and they are not, uh, uh, they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear my wrath, that they should not enter into my rest. Listen, people that fail to acknowledge the worth of God and who God is and what God has done through worship, through true worship, through lowering themselves, are people that are in pride. That's what he said, listen, as opposed to those who, who resisted me in the day of provocation when God said, do this, and they said, no, we're going to do our own thing. And that's not anything new. That day was nothing new. In fact, if you go back to, it's interesting. I just think this is an interesting uh, uh, connection that uh, as Moses was on the mount for 40 days and 40 nights, receiving from God uh, what God was going to do uh, is really the first time we see the children of Israel uh, uh, say, listen, we're done. We're done waiting on God. I'm doing it God's way. We're going to do it our way. And as he was up on the mount, 40 days and 40 nights, <coughs> receiving from God exactly what God desired for him to do, um, it was uh, the people of God uh, looked to Aaron and said, listen, uh, make us a golden calf. We want a golden calf so that we can worship God the way we want to worship God. And uh, and Aaron, uh, no, they didn't say golden calf, but Aaron made a golden calf and said, listen, these be thy gods, O Israel. And, and he, even, he even says that at one point, listen, uh, well, tomorrow we're going to feast and we're going to make sacrifice unto the Lord. We're going to do this unto Jehovah. It's gonna, I mean, this is for him. And, and it had nothing to do with what God wanted to do. And then you get over to the point to where uh, the children of Israel rebelled and said, no, we are not going to enter the land. We cannot do what God's called us to do. And, and God said, okay, you're going to wonder, guess how many years? Forty years. Uh, I think there's not a coincidence there that they wandered for 40 years when it started at their stiff, and, and it's in a place where God says, listen, I've seen this people, they're stiff-necked people. And uh, 
they wondered a year for every day where it started where God had to point out their stiff neck that they would not get right. And a stiff neck person, a prideful person, will not humble himself before God. That is needful for uh, worship. Let's take a uh, just a quick break. I'm just going to step away here for a second, uh, and uh, then I'll give you the time if you need to uh, pause this. Uh, go ahead and pause this, and uh, this video is going to stay running. But you can pause it and go to the restroom, get a drink, whatever you need to do. Uh, I'm just going to take about 30 seconds, and then we're going to get into lesson uh, seven <coughs> of our uh, of our of our class today. All right, so just uh, just a few minutes if you need to step away. Okay. We are back. We are live. Actually, I'm going to wait till right at oh, 41 minutes. All right, 41 minutes. Our video. We're going to come back in. Uh, just give me enough time to find uh, my uh, um, scripture. We're going to start with Psalm 150. Psalm 150. We just got done talking about worship and the importance of worship and having a biblical definition of what worship is. It's so important that we would define things biblically uh, in the Word of God. We we get ourselves in trouble. Uh, when we take unbiblical definitions and we try to live and adopt by them, uh, and, and, we can, and we can create confusion, uh, just get back to the Bible. I'm not talking about uh, uh, being arrogant about people that use, uh, you know, that I'm, just, I'm just talking about, listen, you need to learn what the Bible says, and, and it's the Word of God and what the Bible says that's going to make a difference to the hearers, not not how I, how intelligent I can sound. Uh, God's not interested in how intelligent I can sound. He, he wants us to uh, to uh, give uh, give out his word. So we've been we, we started in Matthew in chapter number six, and uh, we are moving uh, from learning the mechanics of being mechanical to the importance of private praise and worship in your personal spiritual development. And uh, and we're, we've talked about worship already, and how prayer begins with worship, uh, and, uh, and and the definition of worship, and the need of one truly bowing himself before before God. I challenge you to remember the illustration of, of a church service. Be mindful of that when you go to the house of God. You ought to be mindful of that when you go to the house of God. One thing I don't think I said uh, was when, when I was growing up, my dad said, listen, there's two reasons to go to the altar today. There's two reasons to go to the altar. Number one, uh, if God spoke to me, I should find myself at the altar. If God spoke, I should take time to bow myself down before God and acknowledge that he spoke. And number two, if God did not speak to me, I need to get down to the altar and find out why. Two reasons. Right. And, and, and honestly, when we go to church, we should look for we should look for opportunity to worship God. We ought to do that. And uh, then we we end prayer with praises. Our private prayer time ends with praise. Both worship and praise are very important elements uh, of a private prayer life. Uh, and in today's lesson, we're, we're going to be looking at the idea of praise. And uh, many people like to define praise by their own definitions, and they like to define all sorts of things by their own definitions. And to me, praise is this, and praise is, uh, and I think praise is, and uh, in my heart, praise, and so, so on and so forth. But in the Bible, praise is what we're, we're worried about, what we're thinking about, it is all what we're looking at. I want us to look at Psalm 150 before we go any further talking about praise, and I want us to read Psalm 150, uh, follow along with me in your Bible. Psalm 150 says this, verse number one, Praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him in the mighty acts. Praise him according to all uh, excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. And praise him with the psaltery and the harp. And praise him with the timbrel and dance. And praise him with the stringed instruments and, and, and organs. And praise him upon the loud cymbals. And praise him upon the high uh, sounds, sounding symbols. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Man, <laughs> it, it almost would give us the idea that we're always supposed to be praising the Lord and, and, and that everyone is to give God praise. 
Now, uh, sadly, what we've done is we've we've left off worship and we just decided uh, we're just going to praise because praise is more fun. And, and if we're not careful, praise has a tendency to be about us instead of about him. But, but by the biblical definition, it is giving praise to him because he's due our praise. And, and, and I want to remind us of that in the definition uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, being deeply thankful or uh, or, or uh, satisfied in lauding the superior qualities of another. It's not about me. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, uh, uh, it means to praise, to laud, to commend. And that would also be of another, to give applause to. I'm not applauding myself, I'm applauding him. I'm giving him applause. And it, and it is con, uh, condemnation, uh, uh, commendation, not commendation, commendation bestowed on a person for his personal virtue, worth, and actions. And so uh, this is what praise means. It, it's not about me. All right. I don't praise God. Oh, I, I'm receiving praise. No, no, no. We, we, we've got things messed up, and we're, we're going to begin to look at that uh, in, in, in just a second. Uh, but understand with me, uh, words mean something. No one is at liberty to uh, uh, concoct their own definition of what something means. I don't get to come up with my own definition. Not, it's not the biblical urban dictionary. It's not what we're looking for. We're looking for what, what does it mean? When, when, when the writers of the Word of God uh, uh, looked at, the, looked at the, the manuscripts they were given, and they said, okay, we're going to translate this from, from one language to another, uh, it wasn't like we're going to make it say in English whatever we want it to say. No, no, no. What does it mean here, and how how does it how would we translate that uh, into uh, uh, into another language and and keep it perfect and keep it pure and keep it right? Praise the Lord. We have when we hold the, the our King James Bible, we're holding the very Word of God. We are. This is what God said, and so uh, we need to be interested in what God said because. Words all mean something, and if we're to change words and redefine words, listen, friend, then we don't really know God's mind. And your mind is not, listen, your mind is not what we're looking for. And someone else's mind is as fascinating as it might be. It's not what we're looking for. We need to know what God thinks, and we need to know the mind of God. And so when it comes to praise, all right, we have a definition of praise. And then number two, the audience of praise. The audience of praise. So, uh, so uh, uh, the Lord, the Lord is the audience of praise. Look over in chapter number 48. It should be almost on the same page. Look at verse number 13. It says, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. <clears throat> we are to give praise unto him. We are to praise him. He is the only the only audience. When we come to the house of God, the Lord is the audience. That's I, I'm telling you, that's where uh, a lot of our music today is so messed up and is so turned around is that we've made the congregation the audience and we're singing unto them instead of singing unto him. They, they are a participant in us offering praise unto him. I, I might be doing the singing and you might be saying amen. But the reason we're saying amen is because of him. And, and when we get into this, oh, man, you did such a great job. Listen, we have a reward because we did that for ourselves and not unto him. He is the only audience, and therefore praise is to be directed to him. And, and praise should be about him. And, and see, therefore praise should be a, a reflection of who he is, who he is is holy. Let me take a time out. This isn't in there, but let me just say this about music, right? Because music is what we use as a as a medium most of the time uh, to offer praise unto God when we come to a corporate setting. And even when we come to our private private time alone with God, we'll use music as this mechanism by where we offer God praise. And we'll do it with words sometimes, but generally we think of praise, uh, we think of music is what we're, we're thinking of. <clears throat> and, and the reality is this, that we are to use music. Music is biblical. God likes music. We are to sing to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That is a reality uh, of what should take place corporately in the house of God uh, when we come together, that, that there should be singing that take, takes place. And there should be praise that is offered unto the Lord in, in song. 
but the, but listen to me, psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms uh, is it, just part of the instructions. It says this, singing, making melody, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. That that should be the reality of, of our music, is that we are we are that our music should be focused upon the melody uh, of the song. And the melody is something that we do feel in our heart. Uh, music does move us. It does. Music does uh, 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 touch the feeling of our infirmities. Music is in the heart and should be in the heart. It, there's nothing wrong with that. We are singing, making melody in our heart. Uh, uh, that 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 should move us. People use music uh, based upon their mood. Even this world does it very effectively. They will use mu music to set a mood. And, and, and listen to me, uh, music does do that very thing because music speaks to the heart. And God intended for it to speak in the heart and understands that it speaks in the heart, therefore. And, and so he say, says, listen, you to sing, make melody in your heart uh, unto the Lord. And as we sing, make melody in our heart unto the Lord, this is what we're doing. We're praising God. We're giving God praise. The, as opposed to uh, uh, being moved by a beat. Or being moved by a group, a group. I, I think you call it. So there's two different types of music that are used in the church today. There is melody-driven music, all right? And then there is groove or beat-based music. Most of modern stuff, and I'm not against things just because they're modern. I'm not against something just because, it, by definition, it's contemporary. Uh, contemporary has to do with the length of time it's been around, all right? So, so don't act like I, I'm not against the... Uh, contemporary music or modern music uh, as a sense of, and that it's only been written last year. If it is a right biblical message, uh, uh, we ought to give it unto the Lord. We ought to sing it unto the Lord. I don't have a problem with that at all. I do have a problem with this is when we go from a melody-driven music to a groove or beat-driven music. And, and I want to submit to you that you can feel it in your heart. You feel it right there. Uh, I was at a, a service uh, here a, a few weeks ago. And we were singing, and they, in the song, I was like, they're singing Just As I Am. And I'm like, well, okay, that's fine. I, I don't have a problem with Just As I Am. And uh, and it went from the song Just As I Am to a new chorus that's been written. And, and uh, Just As I Am, if you just sing Just As I Am, it's very a, a, a melody-driven. All right? So you're making melody in your heart. It's very melody-driven as hymns uh, 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 are going to be melody-driven. And it went into a, a new modern chorus. And I've heard the chorus. I don't have anything wrong with the words. There's nothing wrong with the words. And maybe you sing them, and I don't know. Uh, that's between you and your pastor and the Lord. My, This is my hobby work. All right? Uh, but it says, I come broken. To, and it leaves the melody, and it goes into a, a group. And I'm just submitting to you that if we're singing, making melody in our heart, when, when we when we bring that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, song in, or we bring that in, we better be careful that it is not the groove or the beat that is driving what we're doing. We need to be very careful, and we need to be honest about it. Because as far as I, I'm just saying, well, you're just having the first one. I don't think so. I've been talking to my, uh, we were saying, I was at the guy that leads our songs. I've been talking about them. I'm training him. He's le learning how to lead our music. And uh, I've been talking to him about these things. And and I said, I don't, you know, it's just something you've got to feel. I said, I said something you got to you got to just know in your heart. I said, that's where it's supposed to take place. And uh, they started singing that chorus. And his, it was me. I was sitting in the pew. My daughter, Olivia, his wife, and then him. And he, he reaches around and when they, about halfway through that first chorus and slaps me. And he goes right. And, he, and, 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 and he's like, I can feel that. No, I'm telling you, the mood of the music changed. Because we went from a melody to a groove. And we better be careful. God desires for his Music to make melody in the heart, which is going to reflect him, not to reflect a beat or a group. So that's a hobby horse of mine, and I'll get off it. But but I'm telling you, when we're talking about praise and, and, and who the audience is, when we're when we're making melody in our heart, I'm telling you, he's the audience. When we're feeling a beat, we're the audience. We're feeling it, not him. And so we need to be careful. Most modern-day Christianity wants to hide behind the concept of praise to act how they want in church. And their music and their atmosphere and their novelty is taken from the world and given a Christian spin uh, so as to uh, be palatable to the masses. 
just as I am, is not is not on the top 40. It's not. The question is this. If what we're offering as praise doesn't reflect who he is, how could we possibly, how could it possibly be about him? How could it possibly be about him? It must be that we're offering to our congregation what we want and blaming it on praise. Must be the reason. Must be what's going on. Number one, if he is the audience, it is not about it is not about how it makes you feel. It's not what music is about. It's not what praise is about. If he is the audience, it's not about how you feel. If he is the audience, it's not about what you like. Uh, uh, this is this is real serious stuff. If we're if we're going to be honest with God about what praise is, it's not about what you like. It's about him. About him. Uh, this uh, Soren Kierkegaard, or I don't know what his name is, I can't pronounce his name, said this. All right, this is a quote. I can agree with this quote. We tend to think of church as a kind of theater. We sit in the audience, attentively watching the actor on stage. If sufficiently entertained, we show our gratitude with applause. Church, though, should be the opposite of the theater. God is the audience. We should not leave a service asking ourselves, what did I get out of this? But rather, was God pleased with what happened? And the reality is this, that the majority of Christians come to church for what they can get out of it. And the majority of Christians approach God for what they can get out of him. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 14, verse 23 and 25, or through 25, uh, I, it's a message I preach to our church every year uh, uh, and, and, uh, and bring before our church every year. Uh, uh, but um, it, it talks about that when the church comes together and uh, they all be in one place, which is a requirement of a church, you have to assemble. And they're coming one unlearned or one uh, un unsaved, all right? They don't know any better or they're not, they don't know Christ one, or the right, one, one way or another. And they sit in the church and all spake in tongues. Okay, they all talked in tongues, and uh, and and as they all spake in tongues, um, the, uh, the the it says this that they'll leave, and they'll be of this. This is what the guest who was unlearned and unsafe says: that they're mad, they're crazy, that they're out of their minds, they're lunatics. That's what the, that's what they'll say. They're mad. And then verse twenty four and twenty five says uh, uh, talks about another church service where people come together, and where they, uh, they, they, sit, they all prophesy, okay? And we saw, well, everybody preaches? No, no, no. It's not everybody preaching, but everybody is in tune with it, has come together for the preaching of the word. And everybody's in agreement with the preaching of the word. They, they all prophesy, okay? Uh, then shall he leave, saying, uh, that, that, that uh, then shall he bow, he'll fall upon his face and worship God. He'll fall upon his face, and uh, his, the, the secrets of his heart will be made manifest. He'll know what God wants of them. And the Bible says he'll leave there with a different thing. Instead of leaving saying they're crazy because they're all speaking in tongues, he'll leave there and he'll say, God is in them of a truth. And if you go earlier in the chapter, it talks about why someone would choose to speak in tongues as opposed to prophesy. And the reason someone would choose to speak in tongues as opposed to prophesy is because uh, they are, uh, uh, the, the tongues is for the edification of self. And prophesying is for the edification of the church. And that's the difference. You come to edify self or you come to edify the church. And so reality is most of Christianity comes to edify themselves. And we look crazy and we look like lunatics. Instead of having people just leave it and go, you want to know where God's at? Or when you're ready to be serious with God, I'll tell you where to go. You go down there to that Baptist church on the corner. Those people meet with God. It's not a show. It's not a it's not an entertainment. It's it's the, this. They meet with God. And that's what we should be after. Because he's our audience. And if anybody's going to be seen, if anybody's going to be seen, if anybody's going to be known, it should be God. It should be God. Number three, 
when he is the audience of our praise, when he is the audience of our praise, everything is about him and for him. I just want to look, take time to look at these, these passages of scriptures. First Kings, first Kings in chapter uh, uh, eight and verse 11, first Kings eight, 11. You kind of get there. Solomon, story of Solomon here, and, and him building the temple, and, and the, the temple of Solomon is, is being built, it's being completed, and uh, and and so uh, there's, I mean, you, you gotta go and read it. I'm just telling you, there's a lot of a lot of, that went into this day, and there's sacrifices, thou, I mean, just in the thousands, and there's singing, and there's there's glorifying of God, and, and there's there's music that is being used. Um, it, it says uh, in, in first in first Kings chapter eight says it says and look at verse oh gosh oh look at verse number ten and it says and it came to pass when the priests were come out and this is after all of the sacrifices have been made and singing is going on and instruments are being played it says and the kings came out and, and when the priests and, and it came to pass that when the priests came out of the holy place. Uh, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. So the priest could not stand to minister because the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. So I, I want us to understand, I'm not trying to diminish praise at all and singing at all. I'm just saying it needs to be done as to who, we need to be mindful as to whom is our audience. We need to be very mindful as to whom is our audience because when it's done right, listen, it, it's going to cause us to to, fall, to, to, to not even be able to uh, continue the service because we've got to acknowledge Him. We've got to give attention to Him. First, Second Corinthians five and verse number fourteen says this. Um, says so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. And it's again talking about the same story. Everything, when everything was about him and for him, the temple was for him, the vessels were for him, the sacrifices for him, the music, both instrumental and vocal, it was for him. And, and listen to me, it caused humility. It caused humility. They were going to go out and, and, and do their, they go out and do the things that they were supposed to do, and they couldn't even stand and do it. They couldn't even stand up and do say, but, all right, well, let's continue on. Because it was already so evident that it was about him, and it could it could go on. And, and when the the glory of the Lord filled the temple, it, we could say this: it was approved of God. It was approved of God. And, and listen, if He's our audience, that's the only approval we're searching searching for. We're not going out into the world and finding out, man, what is the world like? And what is the world? I mean, we want to kind of we want the world. I mean, we want we want visitors to be comfortable in our church when they come in here. So we need to have something that's a little more. You know, for them uh, to listen to and something. You know, we don't want to bore them. And, and, and I'm telling you, when music's done right, it's not boring. We sing hymns every Sunday. I'm telling you, uh, uh, our song service is anything but boring. If it's boring, it's because I'm sitting here thinking about, well, this is what I like. This is what I'm, like. this is what I'm looking for. In music, and, and that's a shame. And that probably shows your private life is is filled with things that you like instead of things God likes. When you're bringing those into the church. But when it's done right, it's approved of God. Then number, uh, I guess, four. Number four. When and how, when and how is praise to take place? When and how is praise to take place? Go back to Psalm in chapter 34. Psalm 34. Psalm chapter 34, verse number one. Psalm 34, 1 says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So when and how is the praise to take place? When? The when of praise, only at church? Only a corporate setting? Obviously, no. Praise is to be continual part of our life. Uh, it is to be a continual part of our life. It is, it is it, both corporately and privately. Praise should be something that's in our heart. 
it, it ought to be something that that is part of who we are. It should definitely, uh, and our life should reflect that. It's a part of it's a part of us, and it should be continually part of us. Uh, there, there's, there's a uh, I just always have a song, yeah, because we we should have praise, and, and God's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of us singing of, uh, unto Him and giving glory unto Him. And, and say, man, every time I, uh, I'm telling you right now, especially uh, with the fall and everything, I'm telling you, it's hard for me not to drive around and just go, thank you, God, thank you, Lord. Uh, I mean, it's just incredible uh, uh, where where we get to live and what we get to see. And I'm so, telling you, the praise of God should always be in our mouth, and, and it should come forth. It should be that, that we have a tune in our, in, in our heart. So that's the wind of praise, continual. It's continually to be praising. The how of praise, well, the how of praise is with singing. With singing, Psalm 47. Look at this, Psalm 47. And, uh, and verse number six, with singing. Uh, it, says, uh, it says, sing praise to God. Sing praise. Sing praise unto the king. Sing praise. Obviously, singing is a part of that. With musical instruments. With musical instruments, Psalm. In chapter 98, verses 4 through 6, it says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing praise unto the Lord uh, uh, with the harp and and and, and, uh, and and with the voice of a psalm, with a trumpet, with the sound of a cornet. Make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar. Roar and the fullness thereof in the world, and they that dwell therein, let the floods clap their hands, let the hills together. So, uh, with musical instruments, uh, this last one, most people don't hang me, uh, but it is in the word of God. Uh, but with dancing, with dancing, now I, it doesn't mean the jitterbug, doesn't mean the, the robot or the floss, all right, nothing, nothing modern, uh, about what, what is being said here. Uh, uh, but uh, it says in Psalm 149, look at verse 1, Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in him and be uh, that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let him, them praise the name uh, in, in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and the harp. And the harp. And, and then it, it says this, uh, for the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. What? The, the, the somebody dance. I know that's that's a taboo in the in the in the uh, Baptist church uh, today, the independent Baptist church. But 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 this is how to praise the Lord with singing, with musical instruments, even with dance. Uh, primarily, it, it means this. It doesn't mean to to have a a, a partner and, and and do lewd things with a another individual. It means to leap, to spring. Hence to leap or move with measured steps regulated by a tune, sung or played in a musical instrument, to leap, to step to graceful uh, with graceful motion of the body, uh, corresponding with the sounds of the voice of an instrument. It doesn't mean grab somebody and rub them up against your body in front of other people and be weird. It's not what it's saying. But but there is a, a man, I can jump around. I can get I can get excited. I can I can man have a spring in my step about what God has done and and, uh, and, 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 and in, a, in a sense. This does not mean all forms of dance are given biblical license or that no form of dance could be uh consider could be considered immoral. It's not what we're saying. Uh, but but there's a, a jumping, a leaping, a praising of God that, that can take place and should take place in our life. In conclusion, in conclusion, praise should be part of the life of the Christian. It should be part of the life of the Christian. We should long for time to praise him in words, in songs, and music. I must, though, avoid puffing myself up or appearing to uh, uh, appeasing to my or being appeasing, appealing to my flesh, desiring to call it praise. Praise to God must be about Him, and He should be the primary audience of our praise. That's going to be our lessons for today, and uh, I hope they're good. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed them. I, I 
enjoy them. And just your subjects that, that I get fired up about. Um, and uh, I have some hobby horses, I guess you would call them about. But but I think they're things that we need to grasp a hold of for our private lives. That uh, that God's at the center of what we're doing, not man. It needs to be very mindful of that. That he's high and holy. We're not. So uh, these are just things to, uh, that I hope you consider prayerfully. Oh, things to encourage other Christians about. They are. And uh, to be mindful of. So uh, uh, we'll be back again live next week. Next week, next Tuesday, I'll be uh, on the live stream with you. And I know COVID restrictions are kind of uh, breaking up a little bit. Um, and so uh, I'm looking forward when I can drive back up there for classes on Tuesday. Uh, it will be nice. Uh, and uh, but until then, until then, we are stuck here in the virtual world. And uh, hopefully uh, there's not much lost in translation from me being live or being here. So let's close in a word of prayer and uh, just trust that uh, you receive a blessing from the classes today and uh, that there's, uh, there's some things that helped you in them as well. Let's pray. Dear God, Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for uh, your opportunity to look into your word and to consider the reality that we have need to be brought low before you. We have need to uh, allow you in place for who you are and uh, to lift you up to, uh, to give you attention. Our lives uh, and our, our outflow of, of our Christian life would be about who you are and what you deserve. Lord, would you help us in this? Okay. Amen.